Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, my name is Elisa Baum and I'm Percona's Director of Product Marketing. We will begin in just a moment, but first I'd like to conduct a bit of housekeeping. Could you please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know if you can hear me? Let me see that. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Next, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. If your question is related to material on a specific slide, please include the slide number in your question. At the end of the webinar, we will take time to answer as many questions as possible. Questions that are most relevant to the topic we're discussing today will be answered first. Those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog entry on Percona's MySQL performance blog. In addition, a recording of this webinar will be made available to everybody within 48 hours. With that said, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, What Every DBA Needs to Know About MySQL Security. It's being presented today by Percona Remote DBA, David Bisbee. With that said, I'd like to turn the floor over to David. Go ahead, David. Hello, everyone. So, my name's David Busby. I've been working at Pocona since January of 2013. I'm currently with the Pocona Managed Services team. That includes the remote DBA service. I'm the EMEA lead and the security lead. Roughly 14 some years as a sysadmin, or DevOps as it now seems to be termed. Uh, volunteer work, I help to teach at a local school uh, computing to children. Uh, we do that on the Raspberry Pi platform. And I'm also a Jiu Jitsu instructor for a local non for profit club. Okay, enough about me. So let's cover the agenda and why you're here today. We're going to look at security above the MySQL layer, how to identify and limit an attack surface, the critical importance of password complexity, rigid grants and selective grants, deploying Gussie Linux, because I know the majority of people are still turning this off at this time, security related changes that are available in MySQL 5.6, the importance of CVEs, and then at the end we'll have some time for Q&A. Okay. So security above the MySQL layer, you've really got to imagine security as something that's applied in layers, and you need to think from the outside in. I know most traditional people talk about thinking from the inside out um, when you're securing a system, but I want to try and help to change that mindset. You need to think about this as if you're an attacker trying to get into the system, what traps and pitfalls are going to be in place to prevent these people getting into your systems. So as such, you need to think about every layer of your deployment. Uh, the ISPs, your hosts, where their ingress points are. Do they have some maybe edge network, IDS and IPS platforms? So that's intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. Does your ISP have an incident response program? Your network ingress, the part that you actually physically control as part of your application. Do you have dedicated firewall hardware? Do you have any SSL terminators in front of your application? SSL terminators will do the SSL handling on themselves and then pass plain text back to the application layer. So there's some special security considerations around that, obviously. Then have a look at things on the OS level, um, whether you can do any packet filtering or control there. For that, at the very basic level, you've got IP tables, net filter, and there's a great new project that's been launched um, called Hacker Security. It looks very interesting. It uses a Lua DSL syntax seems to make packet filtering very, very developer friendly. Uh, just a general if clause. If not allowed, then drop. Um, I would encourage you guys to go and check it out. So also, you need to look inside the internals of your application. Do you have sanitization going on inside your code? So things like sanitizing user inputs. Do you have a web application firewall? Is it configured? And then there's your organizational controls. So continuing this train of thought, there's the old proverb, a chain is only as long as it's, as its weakest link. So from the ISP standpoint, you've got, as I've covered just a moment ago, the network ingress, but equally something that gets overlooked on a too large a scale is the personnel. When the, you call up your ISP or hosting provider, how do they verify who you are? What's their identity verification process? How rigid is this to confirm your identity? What internal security controls do they have in place to prevent, say, malware on one of their call center systems infecting the rest of the network? Do they have any existing compliance certifications, such as PCI, etc.? How do they carry out background checks on their staff? Do they have an existing incident response program with a dedicated team? Does that incident response program have a service level agreement? 
what about their recurring audits? Do they have anything that's publicly available? Do they have pen tests which they could, if they weren't publicly available, share with you to prove that they've been through rigorous PCI or whatever compliance they're seeking at the time? And then do they carry out user access control list audits? If they're PCI compliant, this is something they should be doing regularly. So what about your systems? Now, I've focused a little bit here on the cloud. Um, you, can you can secure your virtual machines, yes. You can put every piece of software under the sun and every rigorous control method. What about the hypervisors or the hardware on which this virtualization takes place? How are they secure? They're beyond your remit. This is something you have to take up with your hosting provider. Does this hypervisor have any host-based intrusion protection or host-based intrusion prevention systems? Do they deploy mandatory access controls such as SE Linux? What about physical security measures? 99% of all vendors you go to for hosting now will have some pamphlet document that says they have um, they have biometrics or they have key cards or they have RFID cards to gain, to authorize entry into their data centers. And that their data centers has a network operation center that's manned 24/7. They have CCTV, etc., etc., etc. But one of the other things as well is, is the block storage encrypted? Now, by block storage, I mean the disks of the virtual machines. You know, where you're storing your database data for your MySQL, where you're storing your application data on disk. How is the block, sto block storage sanitized, if at all, when you delete a VM? A cursory look on Google, and you will find that there are many white papers out there showing recovery of data on a new virtual machine from a previous owner's Owner, owner virtual machine. Are the guests securely isolated? Now a guest is a virtual machine that's actually on a hypervisor. Um, you want to look at things like network. Is the network secured and isolated from other guests in there? What measures can you take? Um, do some in-flight encryption such as SSL. For VPN you've got the nice quick and easy projects like end to end and I've included a link in this and the slides will be made available. End to end is a very easy peer-to-peer -peer VPN setup but you also want memory segmentation as well. So along these lines we're going to look at what is an attack surface and how to limit it. So an attack surface boils down to the points in your application which could be attacked, be it your application, database, physical systems, network, your employees, your hosting provider, but also you've got to consider your hosting provider's employees. So we want to limit this attack service to be as small as possible. So having a look at your application, it should go without saying that you should sanitize all user inputs. I encourage you to check out cross-site request forgery tokens to help prevent this. You want to follow SSL best practices, and I've linked in here a link to the Mozilla security wiki. And in there, there's a couple of subsections you want to pay particular attention to, such as the perfect forwarding secrecy, uh, perfect forward secrecy boils down to a client and the client and server negotiate a key which is never transmitted in communication and also this key is destroyed at the end of the session. Now the DH param setting is when a Diffie-Hellman cipher is used the server sends a prime number and a generator for use by the client. To make sure that it's not been subject to a man in the middle attack these are signed using the DH parameters. You also want to look at deploying OCS, OSCP stapling, which is the online certificate status protocol. When you when your client connects to a server, it should verify the validity of the server certificate using certificate revocation lists, or you may have heard them referred to as CRLs, or they want to use the OCS, sorry, the OSCP protocol. The caveat being that it was found to be fairly easy to knock OSCP off the network by denial of service. So what the stapling does is allow the server to respond with a cached entry for up to 48 hours. The premise being that one of the servers that's actually supposed to serve the OSCP will all be available within that 48 hour period. You want to look at things like web application firewalls and intrusion prevention systems, but more importantly you need people to be able to monitor these, if not on a fully dedicated basis, at least on a recurring basis to check out the logs simply deploying, deploying a piece of software and hoping it's doing its job isn't enough. You need people, people to come in here and check these things out. And also, just as importantly, you need to protect the audit trail. Ship the logs off the IPS or WAF systems onto a protected system where they can't be modified by attackers. 
you want a regular recurring audit procedures, make sure that you're auditing user access and they've only got access to what they need to. You want to check your firewall, ingress and egress controls, and you want to deploy mandatory access controls for things like SE Linux. So continuing the application, you want your application to fail securely or fail safely. Now what does that mean? Um, you want to catch application exceptions and log them out so that you're, you're not constantly re encouraging bugs that are silently hidden. Equally, you don't want to render debug information out to the screen if there's been an issue, because this will throw up a red flag to an attacker that you have an issue with your system, which they have exposed. Equally, there's a change of thinking. You must think carefully about the error messages you present to people. One of the more obvious and examples of this is a login form. If a login form displays invalid user, and then suddenly starts to display invalid passwords, well, I've enumerated a valid user, and now I can target that user for brute force attacks. And a page error that says, you do not have access to this page, can be used to enumerate points of interest for attacking later. Why don't I have access to this? Is there something interesting to go there and have a look? Then there's just plain simple misdirection. We want to intentionally sour the milk for automated tools. 99% of the traffic you're going to get that is a prelude to an attack is scanning software. Well, scanning software doesn't particularly handle very well changes in status codes. Uh, a browser doesn't really care. If you return to your browser 500 status code but then render HTML, well, the browser is going to render it anyway. So I've included a couple of links here. You can do some nice, funny things to misdirect scanning software. You can suppress version numbers reported by your web server, be it Nginx or Apache. You can, do, you can hide headers such as XPowered by, which is sent out by PHP. You can also modify the content of error pages to prevent identification. You can purposely return incorrect response code, as I mentioned previously, and I've got a link off to there. There is a DEF CON presentation I recommend you go and watch called Defense by Numbers where this is discussed in detail. You want to use, utilize things like tar pits to help slow down and make it more computationally expensive to scan your software. And most importantly, you must never hack back. This becomes a very legal fire pit. Regardless of somebody attacking your system, the moment you start to attack their systems back, at the very least, you fall file of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So, limited and attack surface. Let's have a look at your database. You want some logical or physical network segregation from your application nodes just to make it hard to traverse between the two. Logically, you don't want your application service to reach the SSH port on your database server nodes. I don't see any particular reason why that would be needed. You want it to reach port 3306, which is the MySQL, obviously, but not 22, which is SSH. You've also got VLAN segregation, which you can do as well to help prevent things like network sniffing. Again, ingress and egress controls, selective grants, which we're going to get into you shortly, complex passwords. Sounds obvious to most systems. This um, still gets argued as a point for MySQL passwords. I'm going to go into why that is required. You also want to avoid things like identified by the plain password flying over the network in plain text if you've not got SSL deployed. Equally, you don't want to do it on your production systems. Now, the reason I say this is it will appear in your MySQL history file. So if I'm an attacker and I've compromised an application node, let's just say for a moment I don't have a privileged account. It doesn't matter. I'll have a look at your MySQL history and get the credentials for one that is privileged. And then, of course, mandatory access controls like SE Linux and AppArmor. What about your physical systems? You want limitation of access to hardware. The moment somebody has access to the hardware, it's game over. Social engineering is just a new term for con artistry. One of the most famous examples of con artistry is Victor Lustig, who sold the Eiffel Tower for scrap twice in the 1800s, I believe. It's just confidence. It's convincing someone you're someone you're not, and then using that exploitation to get data. You want to challenge implied trust. A badge or a uniform is not identification. Somebody showing up and knocking in on your door in a police uniform doesn't necessarily mean they are from the police. Never rely on a singular control method, especially not biometrics. Check out the Mythbusters um, on the unbeatable fingerprint readers for a great video on that one. You want to remove unneeded services and devices. Now this helps to just make things a little bit harder. Your X server doesn't need Bluetooth, I wouldn't have thought. Um, remove compilation tools like GCC, GDB. You want to remove desktop environments like X, GNOME, KDE, etc. 
Um, on the subject of implied trust, Barclays had a £1.3 million theft uh, in a single day when people turned up supposedly to service the desktop PCs of staff. Therefore, when they convinced the staff they were these IT technicians, they bypassed all physical security measures and walked straight into the back. They installed a little device which is shown bottom right here, which is a KVM that runs over a 2.4 gigahertz connection. So as long as they're in range, they had complete desktop control. You want to look at things like OS level hardening, so you've got the CIS and the Red Hat Enterprise Linux standards, and then of course deploying mandatory access controls. Now your employees, or the meatware as some people refer to them. <clears throat> Awareness training, it's not as painful as it sounds and it doesn't have to be as boring as it sounds, it's just helping people to be a little bit more suspicious when somebody walks into the building and says, hey, I'm here to look at your computer. You know, check with your management that that's actually what they're there for, get the reference number from the company. Social media is also one of the things that a lot of people are a little bit naive about. Um, so I've got a link here, safeinternetbanking.be. They add someone on Facebook uh, as a friend. This person, without thinking about it, accepts the friend request, um, being as the fact that they would had 700 of friends on Facebook as it was. And this is where the person goes to town. Little bit of prosthetic makeup to look like the individual they've just added like a friend, and now you've got access to the full friends list. You've also got access to all the posts this user's making, so you know what their close click social circle is. This person then starts to go around his hometown introducing and talking to his friends and taking photos with them and posting them on Facebook as him and tagging him in them. He then puts the cream on the cake by sending a phishing email to get all of his bank information out and then starts ordering off auction sites. I really recommend you watch this video. It's actually pre presented by a Swiss bank to help promote better internet, safer internet banking. Then in your company, you've got things like bring your own device. Uh, if I was an attacker and I was looking to get information off an individual, the smartphone you have in your pocket is the most ludicrous target. It's the largest repository of personal information. It, for most people, it has their email, it has their banking, it has their social network, it has photos that they've taken throughout, um, throughout the week at least with timestamps and GPS information and everything on. And then there's the implied trust, as the GIF in the top right shows. Do you want to see a magic trick with the phone? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to head out of here as quickly as possible. So then you can move on to things like trying to lock screen bypass if there's even a lock screen on there. Most people don't. Debug abuse via ADB. Um, and then try to use the, abuse the NFC. You've also got remote attacks from things like Karma. Uh, Yasagar, which abuses the Wi-Fi protocol to identify itself as a network you're looking for. Uh, malware apps, famous example of which being the Flappy Birds one when it was taken down off the market. Malware authors went to town, injected malware into the application. People pulled it down and were unknowingly, even though the game functioned absolutely fine, were running malware on their phones. And then there's some issues around the Bluetooth stack in Android at the moment where you can remotely crash Blue Droid. So you've got to be concerned about malicious human interface devices. Uh, a gentleman named Iron Geek gave a great presentation on this. He takes the teeth do we know and he puts it inside a clear case mouse. Um, this is termed as a data leak prevention bypass. You send someone what looks like a novelty mouse, they plug it in with a little bit of circuitry intelligence to detect when somebody does or does not have their hand on there. You start to fire your payload at the appropriate time. <laughs> Again, challenging identity implied trust. It's okay to ask for ID. Seriously, we do do this for the systems all the time, via keys, via passwords. It's not rude to ask somebody. Uh, you also got a couple of other things, uh, really bad examples of social engineering, like somebody calling from the computer security center regarding the virus on your Windows machine. Or equally, there's a DEF CON video, which I've linked here, where with the cons consent of the client, they do a live penetration test pretending to be someone from HR where they click the dreaded link that deploys the malware on the system giving them full remote access, bypassing all of the IPS and expensive technology this client had in place. Just for scale, this is one I have personally. Uh, it's a Teensy Duino and it's there up against a AA cell. Certain allowances are going to need to be made so that you can sleep at night, obviously. You need some trust in your service or hosting provider, but 
please, please, please do your own due diligence on them. You ask for service level agreements, there's no harm in asking whether or not they've been through any security compliance. Things like PCI and HIPAA. Even if you don't need it now, it's nice to know your provider's done it. What about your network? Selective access control lists. Even if it's only IP tables is the only thing you can do. Take, for instance, Rackspace Cloud. MySQL doesn't need to be accessible from everywhere on the internet. It really doesn't. Just limit the access to the MySQL port to the nodes that need it. Let's not forget CVE 2012-2122. Yeah, nobody really likes the CVE naming convention. That's why they started to call things like Heartbleed. This one was a for loop that allowed you to break straight into MySQL if you use the wrong password a thousand times. Logical or physical segregation network, we've covered this previously. Host-based intrusion prevention, host-based intrusion detection systems, network-based intrusion detection systems, network-based intrusion prevention systems are some of your options as well. Ensure you have staff looking at, at the logs. I can't emphasize this enough. Deploying a system and hoping it's going to be the magic solution is just not going to work. Ensure that they're writing the IPS and web application firewall rules as required and doing analysis on the traffic coming in. So, critical importance of password complexity. The default password in MySQL 5.5 is just a standard double SHA-1 pass of the password. The authentication handshake is slightly more complicated. You can see the algorithm for that there. Uh, it uses a per connection salt and this actually has greater entropy than the stored password hash that's within the MySQL user table. So let's assume for a moment the attacker can grab a hash dump uh, or a packet cap privileged account uh, logging in. The mitigation then, if they've compromised your application, becomes time versus reward. For whatever reason, they need to get more privileges on your database server to get what could potentially harm your application. So as with encryption, we want to make it computationally expensive to retrieve the original passwords. So here are some sample hashes that you might find in a MySQL user table. A simple brute force will retrieve the original passwords. So I need to alt tab out here. I'm just going to run this really quick. So this runs in a, a small application called OCL Hashcat. It uses the OCL language and it's cracked all of the passwords in 1.387 seconds. So yes, they're very bad examples of a password and hopefully everybody here is using a much more complicated one in production, but you can see just how easily the brute forcing this is. So this is very trivial to get the passwords from the original account. This is run on budget hardware. It's done very using brute force method. It's not doing you anything fancy. If you've got properly configured patterns or word lists, as the Hashcat website will tell you, you will get much faster hash rates. Here I'm doing about 270 million hashes a second. Most of the things you read about where some passwords were hacked is actually where they've been disclosed and they were hashed with a weak algorithm. Things like LinkedIn where they used MD5 with no salt, if I remember correctly. MySQL only seems to use salt with the passwords on the network authentication side, the MySQL NA as it's sometimes referred to. So conclusion here, the greater the complexity of a password, the longer it's going to take to retrieve. Hopefully that it gives you the edge on somebody having compromised your application node between now and them having complete access over your database, which with you guys being here, as you know, is the meat of your application. So rigid, or, uh, rigid grants and selective grants, they're really interchangeable terms. Um, basically, they boil down to the principle of least, ac least privilege or least, ac least access, or POLP. Think of user ACL audits, which are a PCR requirement. What access does the user have? Do they really need this access? What are the reasons for this access? We do this for the individuals, but you also need to do it for the systems. Your application doesn't need grant all. It probably only needs select, insert, delete, and update. It doesn't need to be able to create and define UDFs, etc. <clears throat> Equally, as I've mentioned there, we need to be worried about super privilege, create routine, insert privilege, and file privilege. So you need to really understand that the with grant option is the key maker. You need to understand that the super privilege can kill any process, regardless of whether it's the user of the process or not. It can write to slaves even when read only is set to one. It can stop and reset all slaves. 
and it's actually deployed as part of all. So doing a grant all will give that user super privileges. You need to understand that the file and create routine can also be abused. Um, in my example, which I've linked here back in my PLMCE talk, the live demo I gave used this to stage a malicious UDF which gave you a full bash shell on the MySQL, by the MySQL protocol. You also need to understand that the insert privilege can also be abused if you insert directly into the MySQL user table, for instance, whilst the credentials you create might not be available right away, next time they're flushed, that account will then be available. And again, just emphasizing the point with grant option, please, please, please don't put this on your application. It's the keys to the kingdom. Seriously, don't do it. Deploying Gussie Linux. So disclaimer, your mileage will vary, not may vary. I recommend that you test it, especially when it comes down to how sensitive you are on the performance overhead. It should be minimal, and there's ways to tune it out there if not. So the what before the why, SE Linux is a mandatory access control. Turn it on. So your ETC SE Linux config should read enforcing and targeted. I'm not going to cover MLS, that's its own special, special level of difficulty that we won't be covering here. It also now works on AMI Linux, and I've linked off to my personal blog link there discussing it and how you can deploy it on Amazon AMI. So SE Linux uses labels. Labels are contexts which are applied to files, ports, etc. You'll see them laid out in the following syntax, which is the user, the role, the type, and the level. The targeted policy, as I've been reliably informed, only really looks at the type. Now, policies are type enforcement policies. You'll see these dotted around as .t files. So some example here is you have a process A, let's say for sake of argument MySQL, running in the context B, MySQL D, for instance. Context B is allowed access to context C, D, and E, but not F. So, real example. MySQL D type, you want it to be able to access your data, uh, your log directory, and the MySQL port. You can see the pattern of uh, the type enforcement context here. But you probably don't want MySQL to be able to go and do things like get access to the password file in etc password, get access to the shadow file where your user credentials are, start to do things with HTTP ports, SSH ports, the list goes on. So this comes down to discretionary access control versus mandatory access control. So discretionary access control is your typical POSIX permissions, your file level permissions. Software still runs as a user and the discretionary access control method is such that it believes that the software running as that user should have any access that a user would running in that environment. But really, you don't want software to be able to do things that a user is doing. You don't want your software to go and automatically access websites. You don't want your software to go and Google search. You don't want your software to send emails unless it's an MTA server. <laughs> think of things like viruses and malware. You especially don't want them to do the things they're doing for command and control servers, which is call home. And there's the age-old scenario, discretionary access control, where a Chmod 777 is essentially the shotgun plus foot method of security. Yeah. So I actually abuse, again, back to my PLMC video, a Chmod of 777 on the plugin directory allows with abuse of the file and create routine privilege to stage a malicious UDF. And that allows you to run shell commands via the MySQL protocol. OK, so debugging. Most important thing when you're working on a system, you want to know how to debug it. Set in force zero. This is the only time I'm going to ever advocate this. It sets it in permissive. It does not set it to off. This puts it in a log-only mode but you must ensure you always go back to setting force one, which puts it in enforcing mode. Liken this to when your ISP might ask you to deploy an IDS system where they put it in training mode. This will allow you to run all of your tasks, log all of the blockages that would otherwise occur, and then go back to a secure environment after addressing the policies and the context labeling, which might be wrong. Now, there are a bunch of new tools which make this even easier. 
The SE Trouble Shoot server gives you a nice friendly kernel message that tells you to run the SE Alerts L with a unique UUID for the event, and it will actually output on in plain English what the issue was and what you, it thinks you can do to remediate the issue. If you're a Python dev, you can use the LibSE Linux Python to start interacting with these services as well. Nine out of ten issues are incorrect labeling. Common gotchas are new files and directory in, inherit labels. However, moved copies and files keep the original context they had before they were moved. So SE Linux arrests out of context behavior. As I mentioned before, the UDF staging of the malicious UDF. Now, with SE Linux on, by default, this is blocked. It's an additional layer of security. It's not a replacement for multiple layers. CVE 2013-2094 was not blocked by SE Linux by default. This was a privilege escalation using PerfSW event. It does, however, allow just-in-time patching where possible using SE Linux. To, in this case, the Red Hat Bugzilla, which I've linked here, you could change the user context to a different context that would prevent the root shell from spawning. So living with SE Linux, most of your tools have the dash Z or dash Z option. You have ls-z, you have your ps-z, and some example outputs there. MySQL and Pocona server work out of the box from my limited testing, um, for the defaults at least. If your data vertder is valid MySQL and your port is 3306, then you're absolutely fine. You want to install the tool set as work with working with anything else. Install the policy core tool, tools, the SE tools console. There's a whole list here. I encourage you to download those slides after the webinar. There's a couple of booleans uh, within SE Linux, which is the MySQL connect any. It allows MySQL D to connect to all ports. You possibly don't want that one on. And then there's the allow user MySQL connect. This allows Linux users to connect to the MySQL socket not MySQL users. So it's not going to have any effect on your users within MySQL that you've done grant for your remote application nodes, for instance. So quickly then, what if you don't want the defaults? What if you want to change the data directory? Well, that's easy enough. You just need to tell SE Linux that you're using a custom directory path. As you can see here, it's a very simple regex pattern. How about the port? Simple again, just let SE Linux know that you're changing the port. Equally, orchestration frameworks make this easier to use and easier to manage. For example, in Ansible, you have, with the libse Linux Python module installed, the ability to set the various contexts on files as you deploy them. So there's an example there where I've set the owner and group to MySQL, I've set the mode to 0755, it's a directory. Uh, I've set the appropriate labels for the user, the role, the type, and the level. You can also use it to manage the SE booleans across your systems. Okay, so security related changes in 5.6. Password expiration. Now, you can set the default password lifetime by default is 360 days. And you can disable password expiry by setting this to zero if you really, really needed to. Again, I wouldn't recommend that. You have different types of behavior you can deploy here. Disconnect on expired password. You can set this to no, and it will drop the user to a sandbox in which the only thing they can do is change their password. Or you can set it to yes. If the password is expired, it will just shut down the connection entirely. If you need to force an expiry for a particular user, you can do this using the alter syntax as shown here. You can also just update the flag in the MySQL user table, which is password expired. I have done some testing locally, and I've found this to not be available in MariaDB 10, and it's to be implemented in later 10.x versions. I've linked there the discussion thread that's on Launchpad, and just to note there, my testing was done against 10.0.1.2. There's the password validation plugin. Uh, this goes back to the password complexity I was mentioning before. So the validate password policy is set to a level. Uh, in this case, you've got low, which is anything greater or equal to eight characters. Medium, which is all the requirements of low, which is greater than or equal to eight characters, has to have greater than or equal to one number, greater than or equal to one uppercase. 
and then it goes to strong. I'm still not quite sure why this wasn't called low, medium, high, but there we have it. We've got low, medium, and strong. All the requirements are medium, but also has the ability to specify that any substrings that are greater than or equal to four characters must not appear on a specified dictionary file. It's extremely customizable. You can set where the dictionary file is. You can set what your minimum password length requirement is. You can set what your mix count is, your number count, your special character count, etc. It is circumventable. It's understandably circumventable. If you go off onto another machine and you use that to do a select password parenthesis, the weak password, for instance, and then use that in your grant syntax when you put it in the when you're creating the user. MySQL is not going to try and reverse engineer the hash that you put in. It's going to trust that it follows your password guidelines. Again, this isn't available in MariaDB 10 when I tested it pre uh, earlier on. It is, however, in a JIRA, and I've linked the JIRA there, which is MDEV 6431, and it's planned for release in 10.1. Then you've got pluggable authentication. Pluggable authentication, the default one shipped by Oracle, is the SHA-256 password plugin. And this stores the resulting password hash in the MySQL user's authentication string column. It opens the possibility for stronger algorithms as well, things like bcreate B to pdftk. It allows the API to be exploited, if you will, to make things more secure. It's not yet available again in MariaDB 10. There is a dev list thread I've linked here, and it will be implemented, as I understand it, in a later 10.x version. SSL. Now I know SSL's had a bit of a beating lately with Heartblade and all the review that's going on, but still it's one of the core systems used for encrypting data in flight. You have a tunable cipher spec. You can actually specify the limited amount of ciphers that you want to be able to use in your SSL communications. Again, I'd refer you back to the Mozilla Security Wiki for recommendations there as to what are strong algorithms. MariaDB 10 does support this, and this was working and testing in 10.0.1.2. It does have a high performance head overhead. However, this is mostly just due down to the connection handshake. So if you use connection pooling, etc., a lot of this issue goes away. The client um, cannot force a SSL or TLS connection, however, and there's a link here off to Todd Farmer's blog post which discusses this issue. And in these sorts of events, what will happen is it will silently fail to negotiate an SSL connection and continue in plain text. So something to be aware of there. This can easily be checked by checking the status in the connection. However, it's just something you need to be aware of. OK. So now we come down to the importance of CVEs. A CVE is a common vulnerability and exposure. It's the common classification and notation used of known vulnerabilities. So CVE 2013-2094, which is one I was discussing before, is basically a serial number for the Perf SW event that we mentioned that allowed local privilege escalation. It's the common indicator that vendors and researchers will use in general to discuss a vulnerability and its patching. You also have something called CVSS scoring, which helps to estimate the impact and severity of the issue. The syntax did change in January of this year to allow more than 9,999 filings per year. The additional resources that I recommend you check out are things like the Open Source Vulnerability Database, Secuna, the National Vulnerability Database, exploitdb.com. There is a subreddit called NetSec on Reddit that's worth keeping an eye on. There's the good old Hacker News on news.ycombinator.com. And finally, it seems the full disclosure list has been reopened under new management. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Matt. Dave, thanks so much. Uh, some really great insights into uh, what people should be aware of, not only for security for MySQL, but other parts of their infrastructure and applications. Um, just want to remind everyone that uh, we are uh, taking questions and just fill out the question uh, form in the GoToMeeting application. Uh, and then cover, uh, uh, we have a few um, 
webinars coming up. Uh, Dave, thank you so much, and audience, thank you for joining us. Uh, the next webinars uh, are um, actually before I do that, let's talk about some uh, services that Percona offers. Um, so related to security, um, we, we offer a variety of services, but uh, two that stand out are our consulting and our managed services offering, including remote DBA. Consulting um, activities are typically shorter term engagements. Um, and for security projects, for example, we do gap assessments on MySQL and infrastructure and implement changes in collaboration with the customer. Uh, these are available for remote or on-site um, activities. Uh, and projects. Um, and then for more longer term um, needs, um, that's where our remote DBA team, um, uh, that including uh, Dave Busby here, um, uh, um, is available. So um, not only can they kind of, can they fix the problems that are present today, but they can really help organizations operate under best practices uh, as their application needs grow and as their business grows, uh, they can operate uh, under using these best practices in collaboration with with Percona. Um, and beyond just uh, some of the topics that Dave presented here on security, uh, it's a it's a service that um, manages your entire uh, database uh, operations needs if if needed. Uh, things like backup, recovery, uh, and along those same lines uh, for um, twenty four seven operations. Um, so let's uh, jump to the next slide real quick, Dave. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we also have uh, the next Percona Live event coming up um, in April. If you joined us in uh, Santa Clara, um, we had a, a great turnout uh, for the Percona Live High School Conference and Expo. And uh, we're coming back to London in November, uh, the 3rd through the 4th. Uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, learn more about topics like this uh, from experts like Dave not only from Percona, but also uh, from other uh, leading companies around the world who use MySQL. Uh, so um, uh, there'll be uh, some great tracks on um, MySQL needs and concerns. And uh, just to remind everyone, early bird pricing is available now, uh, but it's not gonna be available for long. So uh, follow the link below or just go to PerconaLive.com for more information. And I think that's uh, the next slide is the Q&A. So with that, um, please uh, type your questions into the GoToMeeting uh, uh, application and we'll get to them. Uh, but about those webinars, um, next week uh, we have a uh, webinar called Putting MySQL Fabric to Use. Um, so this is a great uh, topic uh, that uh, our presenters will discuss the MySQL Fabric project. If you're not familiar with it, uh, it's a new thing from uh, Oracle um, focused on sharding. Uh, so they'll discuss the MySQL Fabric project and then jump straight into live demos and some specific use cases. It's going to be a very interactive webinar. And in fact, we're going to provide vagrant images so everyone can install the environment on their local machine and participate. Uh, so register now. And if you want to learn about MySQL Fabric, it's a great opportunity to join us next week. Uh, and then the following week um, will be around uh, advanced query tuning. Uh, so it's, there's a, a webinar planned for, um, called Advanced Query Tuning in MySQL 5.6 and beyond. Uh, it's where uh, one of our consultants, Alex Rubin, will discuss advanced techniques to tune MySQL queries and indexes to significantly increase the performance of your application. Uh, it's going to include Percona's best practices for opti optimizing My MySQL queries and include new topics, um, especially related to MySQL 5.6 and Percona 0.5.6. So some great upcoming webinars. Uh, and visit Percona.com to register today and get them on your calendars. So uh, with that, we'll get to some, uh, some questions. And we'll start with a question about uh, vendor appliances. Um, so Dave, are you there? I'm here. Great. So would a commercial option such as a vendor appliance for network security be enough to protect my systems? It depends on the level of service that you're going to get from that vendor. If you get a black box, which, let's say for sake of argument, it was something like the Google Search Appliance, which you deploy and you forget, then my answer to that would be not a very good, it wouldn't be a very good solution. If you, however, there are vendors out there that employ a subscription-based service, whereby they monitor this appliance and they update it with the rules, etc., for emerging threats then you are much better protected and that would be the one that I'd encourage you to do. 
again, this comes down to doing your own due diligence, um, what sort of reputations that they have, how good are they catching emerging threats as they appear. This should all be stuff that you would be able to get from their salesperson, and if not, you should be able to find via reviews on the website. Okay, great. Um, so has the overall state of security in MySQL improved or degraded with the advent of cloud services like Amazon Web Services? That's a particularly good question. Um, I would like to say that it's brought a few things to light and it's helping to drive security within the MySQL ecosystem. It's causing a, a lot more rigidity and thinking about the way things are actually going to work within MySQL and I believe there's some further improvements that are going to be making their way into 5.7. Things like having better granularity over user control rather than just down to the table. It can be down to various other actions which are actually being worked on in 5.7. Um, from an AWS standpoint, uh, my only issue with AWS and Amazon in general is a lot of their stuff is very play, play very closely to the chest and um, I don't believe as much in terms of optimizations and security patches that are passed back up source, but then I could be mistaken. Okay. Um... So this is a question about HA proxy. Um, how how would you fix an HA proxy problem? Let's say you know could anybody connect to HA proxy an HA proxy server and use its permission to connect to the database server? No, a HA proxy just routes your traffic to the individual systems. So HA proxy, unless you deploy a layer seven check, for instance, that's logging into MySQL and reporting back via custom script. HE proxy is basically a dumb fire. It's going to take a TCP connection. It's going to drop it onto your up system. So, from a HA proxy point of view, it should never be able to intercept or use those MySQL credentials. When again, when I say when you start passing down to layer seven check, then you have issues there. If you manage to compromise the HA proxy system, you could, in theory, then get access to those credentials. But then that comes down to what grant structure you've placed around that user in the first place. And equally, if you're thinking about the handshake scenario I gave, where you could capture a privileged user and break that, then yes, that would be an issue. Because at the HA proxy level, you could packet sniff. Again, that comes down to how well you secure the system. OK. Um, you mentioned logs uh, many times in your presentation. Do you have a recommended audit plugin for production use? We're currently within the managed services team working with a fairly large HIPAA compliant customer to roll out the Pocona audit log plugin. Um, our team have also been reviewing a couple of other. There's the McAfee audit log plugin and there's the MariaDB audit log plugin, I believe, as well. Uh, I would encourage you to also check out the slide deck that's going to appear from Pocona Live. There is a submitted session from one of my colleagues, Andrew Moore. He's actually been digging and deep diving into the logging there. Excellent. Uh, just to remind everyone in the audience uh, to uh, submit your questions uh, for uh, Dave to answer. We'll get to as many as we can uh, before the top of the hour, and any follow any additional remaining questions will be at, uh, um, answered in a follow-up blog post. Um, so, Dave, what issues you mentioned SC Linux? What issues can I expect when I uh, deployed SC Linux on my systems? Out of the box, um, quite potentially, it's just going to stop things from working right away. Uh, that's the main issue most people have, and there's still a lot of very antiquated blog posts around the internet, unfortunately, that say, just turn it off and forget about it. Well, we're not in a point anymore where we can start to ignore security for usability. So what you want to be able to do is immediately go back to the 740 option I mentioned and do your logging for your application. You know, Get out your debug logs that are going to allow you to remediate this issue and then work to resolve them using the tool set that's available. We've got the audit to Y, uh, the audit to module uh, tool set. You, as I mentioned before, the SE troubleshoot server will actually spit out human readable context that will give you an idea as to what the issue is and how to remediate that problem. SE Linux is one of those things that when it originally came out was a nightmare to use. It came out in, an inf it came out in a singular policy which essentially put it out as if you didn't have a policy written for an application then it never ran. And of course uh, with it being an emerging technology it didn't have many policies which started things to get sh shot in the foot basically. 
with the targeted policies now, you have targeted policies that lock software into a specific context. And these are being driven by, by companies like Red Hat. Specifically, one of the good blogs to check out is Dan Walsh from Red Hat. He's got a, a blog pretty much dedicated to SE Linux issues, diagnostics, improving, how you can use it to run things in essentially a jailed environment if you don't trust them at all. Take your Firefox browser and run it in a jailed environment. So in terms of what problems you run into with an application, they will all appear in your logs. So have a look at setting force zero, run your debug, work to remediate the issues, and then turn your security back on. And it will arrest out of context behavior. And there's a couple of links in there to the PLMCE talk that I mentioned previous that showed how to compromise everything from your application right down to the database server. Great, great. I've got some questions about uh, the presentation and the recording. And both of these will, uh, items will be made available to attendees after uh, the webinar concludes. Um, and just a reminder, uh, type your questions into the uh, GoToMeeting application and we'll get to them. Um, so you mentioned uh, with SE Linux um, concerns possibly about the user experience. And I'm wondering, uh, will some of these measures that you have included here increase application latency? There's always the potential for that. There shouldn't be is the longer the short answer. As I mentioned earlier on, it, it's a case of your mileage will vary. It's, it's no replacement for testing to see whether or not you get latency. If you turn it on and everything works as expected, but your latency shouldn't, suddenly shoots up, then it may be down testing Linux. It comes down to how much of that is an issue. If you're putting on five seconds, for instance, for an, app, for an application page load time, well, then there's something seriously wrong there. And you could have a look at tuning things like the ABC cache. It could be warm-up time. Like anything else, it takes time to put everything into memory when it's reading from disk. In terms of the testing that I've done, uh, I've not really seen any depreciable drop in very basic performance tests when SE Linux is on. But again, it's entirely dependent on what's actually occurring in your environment. If you've got an application server that's running Apache or Nginx with PHP, FPM, but it's also got your MySQL server, it's also got your Memcache server on there, it's also got some bespoke daemons that you've written running on there, and there isn't much memory to speak of on said system, just enough to actually keep everything humming over, you might have a problem where SE Linux is splitting between the ABC signatures to such a degree that it starts to impose latency. Again, as I mentioned, I recommend your own testing. And then uh, maybe for this testing and even production environments uh, with, with logs, can you re recommend any specific log analysis tools for security purposes? Perhaps ones that the remote DBA team uses? In terms of log analysis tools, um, there's a couple of good solutions out there at the moment, but they do have some weighty licensing attached to them. Things like Splunk will allow you to drill into products really. Um, yeah, sorry, they allow you to drill into your production logs really, really easy and filter there, but they come at a cost of how much gigabyte you're shipping around. If you've already got things like Logstash and stuff deployed, um, then you can actually you start to build your own infrastructure on top of that and your logs. Uh, what else is there? If you've got search appliances such as Sphinx or Elasticsearch, you can leverage those to help filter through your logs and make your life easier. You can build Python multiprocessing scripts to help filter out through your logs. Um, I've got one up on GitHub that I wrote four or five years ago that would take Apache logs and, produce, and actually render them down about 120 lines per second into CSV stats because that was a use case. I don't think anything's going to be replacing the old Mark 1 eyeball and old orc grep and said. However, there are tools out there to make your life easier, especially with reconciliation of events. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, just want to remind everyone um, uh, about the upcoming webinars that we have um, next week on putting MySQL Fabric to use and the following week about uh, advanced query tuning. Um, uh, that's all the questions that we have. Um, but uh, uh, I'd like to thank Dave for his time for presenting today uh, and uh, the audience for joining us uh, here uh, for the presentation. So, um, Elisa, any uh, uh, 
things that any other follow-ups that you have? Um, no, I just would like to thank everybody. Thank you, David, and thank you for Matt and audience. Thank you very much. And um, with that said, I think we will end for today, and we hope to see you next week. And everyone have a wonderful evening, day, or morning, depending on where you're, when you're accessing us from. Okay, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.